Right. Yes, greetings to all. Um, all right, if you can turn to Psalm 91 for a start. Yeah, all right. I'm, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, God's promises. And um, we realise that God can't go back on his promises, uh, that once he has said something, he can't uh, change it and uh, he can't recall the Bible, if you like, um, after he has given it to us. We can't uh, change it again. And uh, he can't change his salvation plan either because uh, I've spoken to people that have said that now you can give your heart to Jesus or you can do some other thing. But many people died in the early church preaching the gospel that we preach. So uh, it would be very difficult for the Lord to explain to them how he made it easier in the latter time. Of course, we know he hasn't done that. Uh, he's kept the same gospel all the way through. But here in uh, Psalm 91, it's a very famous scriptures. In verse 1, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Uh, surely he should deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome noisome pestilence shall cover thee with his feathers under his wings shall thou trust uh, thy truth shall be thy shield and buckler um, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday so the Lord here is talking about a secret place a place where he has covered us. And uh, it's like a hiding place um, where he can look after us. And when you consider the, um, uh, like a chicken or something like that, that has its chicks underneath it, uh, that's about as safe as the chicks can be. And that's what the Lord does with us. He says that um, we're under the shadow of his wings um, and we've got nothing to fear from uh, any kind of pestilence or a pestilence meaning a plague. Uh, and all the other things that people fear, we've got no reason to fear those things. And in verse 7, it says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thy eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So it's really talking about the end times when the Lord returns. Um, many will fall, uh, but it won't come to it won't come nigh us. And I know there's some people that believe in secret raptures and things like that, but this scripture talks about us being here when it happens. And um, in verse nine, it also says here, um, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, and they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest they dash thy foot against the stone. So once again, it, it reinforces that um, no plague will come nigh our dwelling either. So these are promises that God has made, and it, it says that he will give his angels charge over or, or care over us um, while all this is going on. And in verse 13, it says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion, and the dragon shall thou trample under feet, because he has set his love upon, thee, upon me. Uh, therefore will I deliver him, uh, sorry, I deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. It's talking about us. The Lord will lift us up on high when he returns. And um, he shall call upon me and I shall answer thee and I will be with him in trouble and will deliver him and honour him with long life 
will I satisfy him, show him my salvation. So these are promises that the Lord has made for those that love him and those that uh, make our dwelling place in the secret place of the Most High. So these scriptures are very powerful and they have great promises in them. But um, to know the name of the Lord is to know his power, not to just know his name, uh, but the power that comes with his name. And it's interesting that these verses are quoted in the New Testament as well. So we'll go to Luke chapter 4. Okay. Um, just in verse 1, we read, and it says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. When they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So we find the Lord is um, in a very low situation. He's fasted 40 days, so he would have been very hungry. And this is the time that the devil chose to tempt him. And it says he starts off with the statement, if thou be the son of God. And uh, it's an interesting uh, phrase to say to the son of god if you're the son of god turn this these stones into bread and um in a way the lord does that when he tempts us as well he says if you're the sons and daughters of god why is this happening or why is that um, happening to you and in a sense it's a it's a challenge to god not to us uh, because the lord has made promises concerning us. And in verse 5, it says, And the devil take him up into a high mountain, showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power I will give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whosoever I will give it. So it's interesting that, the devil tempted the Lord by offering him all the kingdoms of the world because he said they're mine to give. But, of course, we know that the Lord wasn't interested in the kingdoms of this current world, and he still isn't. He wants to establish a kingdom on the earth that's an everlasting one, not like the temporal ones that are here now. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine, verse 7. Verse 8 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. So each time the Lord answers with scripture. No, he doesn't try to argue or anything like that. He just simply quotes scripture. And in verse 9 it says, He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou there be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash their foot against a stone. That's the um, verse that's quoted in Psalm 91. Uh, so the devil is fully aware of the promises of Psalm 91. And they're not just for the Lord, because when we read in Psalm 91, it promises long life. And we know that the Lord didn't have a long life on the earth. But that wasn't what he was here for. He was here to die on the cross as a manner that he did so that we could have eternal life. And so those promises could be ours. And um, it says in verse 13, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed for him from him for a season so it's saying here that he didn't depart from him for the whole time he just withdrew himself and it's interesting that uh, we get the impression that the devil can't deal with faith 
because of the Lord's incredible faith, of course, that we know that he had. But he would withdraw from faith uh, because he can't deal with it. Um, he hates it. We'll go to... Um, We'll go on to verse 16. Um, oh, actually, verse 14. And it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. There went out the fame of him throughout all the region around about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and it was his custom was, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of those that were in the synagogue were fashioned on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So he quoted uh, Isaiah and he quoted um, the promises of God uh, that were written in Isaiah. But he said, today they are fulfilled in your ears. So he brought those scriptures to life. And, of course, we know that Jesus is the word made flesh. So he was the living uh, fulfillment of prophecy. But it's interesting there that um, these particular um, things that are healed here, um, preach the gospel to the poor, hear the heal the brokenhearted, deliverance to captives, recovery sight to blind and liberty to them that are bruised, they're not just natural healings, they're spiritual healings. They're the healing of the soul. And they're very relevant today with the amount of uh, depression that people have today and uh, how things can um, affect them mentally and all of that. The Lord is promising to give people liberty and to set them free of all these things that would afflict us. And they are promises that we can take uh, on board in our life and in our walk in the Lord. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. And in uh, verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The earnest is the, um, the down payment of the spirit. So it's a guarantee. The Lord has given us a guarantee by his Holy Spirit that uh, he has anointed us. And then now all of the promises are yes and amen. Amen means so be it. So all these promises are belong to us now because we've had the down payment of the Holy Spirit. And when you first received the Spirit, I know myself, it was an amazing feeling, something like I'd never, ever had before. But that was only the foretaste or the down payment of what is to come. So we can get this and imagine this amazing promise that we have uh, coming to us when the Lord returns. We'll go to uh, just an interesting example in Exodus chapter 10. Back to the Old Testament. Uh, in 
Exodus chapter 10. Um, and verse 21, this was during the plagues uh, whereby God uh, demonstrated his power to Pharaoh uh, through the word of Moses. Um, and in verse 21, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now, this is an amazing um, prophecy and it was fulfilled for the children of Israel because they still had light in their dwellings. That's a, a miraculous thing. That's a miracle because they didn't have electric light or anything like that. The Lord was the light for their dwellings. But there was a, a time in Egypt where there was a thick darkness. It was so dark that you could feel the darkness. And when you look at the world today, uh, the Bible describes Egypt really as the world we're in today. And uh, there is a thick darkness around us and it surrounds us. And it's almost a plague now because people are so um, in darkness everywhere you look. But yet we have a light in our dwelling, you know. So looking at Psalm 91, the, none of the plagues of these things come nigh to us. Um, we have this... Uh, separation and Israel were at that time God's people and that was a, the example that throughout all of these plagues they Pharaoh could see that God was with them so that's part of all of these promises even though they were made back then are uh, for us today um, Hebrews chapter 11 Back to the New Testament. Um, I have to get there. We've read these verses many times, but I'm just going to read them again. Verse 1 of Hebrews, Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's a, a promise in itself. It's saying faith is a substance, even though many people would say faith is, is not a substance. How, how can you believe that? But it's actually something substantial for us. We know that the promises are true, and we know that they are feel, fulfilled by something that we can't see. They are the evidence of what we can't see. And that's in itself is the promise that we stand on. Because it says in verse 6, but without faith is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you come to God, you have to believe that he is, for a start, that he is God and that he rewards us when we seek after him. Those promises are what separates us from the people of this world um, because I have no faith in God. I see that all the time when I see the authorities of this world and the ones that speak about helping us uh, they say they're going to help us but they don't believe in God you know so we should really hearken unto the ones that do believe in God and that's how we build up each other's faith in this time in this time of difficulty and it goes on to talk about the various heroes of faith and I'm not going to read all of that but it talks about the Old Testament people 
that believed. And in fact, it says that Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So all you could do in the Old Testament was to believe. And that was really salvation. There was keeping the law, yes, but it had to be done by faith. So all of the Old Testament people, and we'll read this particular scripture, it says in verse 36, um, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, uh, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Others were had a trial of uh, cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. And they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now, that's an interesting statement that the Lord said of all those in the Old Testament, they saw the promises afar off, but they didn't inherit it. Um, Abraham was told that the land he stood on would one day belong to his descendants, but it never belonged to him. And many of them received promises, uh, but never inherited them. And they saw them afar off. We, we sing a chorus, uh, creating me a clean heart. And one of the verses in it says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people. And, uh, but it left them again. And it moved on them to do different things, but then it left them again. But for us, it comes and it lives within us forever. So we are a part of those that would receive the promise because it says that, I'll read verse 39 again, it says, and these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So it's saying that we are, have received the promise that they only saw afar off, that the last shall be first, the first shall be last. It's, it's really a description of those things. We're part of a totally different covenant situation than those of the Old Testament were. And there's a good example of that if we go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and just one verse here. It says in verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is none risen greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he is the least of the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Now, it's interesting that John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. So when you run into Muslims, you can tell them that Muhammad wasn't a prophet. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And it talks about him. It says of those born of women, uh, there's none greater than John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So what it's really saying is that a, a seven-year-old spirit-filled child is greater than John the Baptist. And in fact, we're all greater in the fact that we have received the promise that he saw afar off. Many people say to me from time to time, what about the thief on the cross? You know, is he saved? And the thief on the cross and John the Baptist all both died in the Old Testament. So they couldn't, neither of them could receive the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. So they are part of the Old Testament. They believed 
and it was accounted to them for righteousness. That's what people don't understand. The difference between the New Testament believer and the Old Testament believer. Because the book of Revelation speaks about the first resurrection. And those that are part of the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. And they will rule and reign through the thousand year reign. So we're part of that first resurrection because we're part of the New Testament covenant. So the promises of the Old Testament apply to us. We have them all upon ourselves. We are the new Israel, uh, the new ruling of, with God. It's just from every race and from every nation. We're all part of Israel now. Um, we just go to First uh, John chapter 3 and finish up there, I reckon. Uh, that's the epistle of John. And in verse 1 of First John, chapter 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And that's very much the case. The world doesn't know who we are. But the important thing is that we recognise each other for what we are. It is very important that we know that we're each sons and daughters of the living God. And so we should treat each other in that way. And when we look in the mirror, um, we don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. And maybe we should. And uh, that way we can take hold of his promises that are given to us. And then verse 2 says, Behold, now uh, we are the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there's going to be an incredible change for all of us when the Lord appears and we're going to be like him. Very, very hard to imagine anything like that. But that's the promise the Lord has made and he can't go back on his promises. Uh, what he has said will come to pass. So we don't know what we're going to be like, but we just got to know that this is our portion and just as the devil was uh, tempting the Lord by saying, if you're the son of God, um, let's not let the world tempt us in that manner. We know we are the sons and daughters of God. So we know that those promises abide with us. And it says that in verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him, purify himself even as he is pure. So we're going to change. And so we have to continue a process of change now while we're here, uh, because one day we're going to be changed totally and we'll be able to see the Lord face to face. And all the people said, Amen. Okay, back to you guys. Amen. Uh,